Your solar generation is working well, generating electricity just as you'd hoped. But now you're wondering, could you increase that generation? What if you added a wind turbine? That could potentially double it. Even better, you'd now be generating at night and during the winter when sunlight is scarce. I mean, it sounds ideal, but is it workable? Let's find out. Hi there, I'm Gary and welcome back to my channel, Gary Does Solar. I get it, you've made an investment into solar panels on your property and you're already finding that it's saving you a lot of money on your energy bills and you're helping out the environment at the same time. And now you might be thinking, maybe there are other ways I could generate electricity. And one obvious candidate is generating energy from the wind. Think about what's happening in your country today. It might already be generating energy from both solar and wind. In the UK where I live, there's a website called Energy Dashboard and it shows the relative mix of different energy generation sources like wind, solar, gas, nuclear, hydro, etc. over different time periods. I've selected a week's worth of generation at the end of July. If we filter this chart to just show wind and solar, you can see that whilst the sun only shines during the day, as expected, there is almost constant wind generation day and night to supplement that. Now this is a typical weekly profile in the summer. Let's now look at the profile during the winter. It's a very different picture. There's a lot less sun, and that's of course because the days are shorter and the sun is much lower in the sky. And I think that those of us with solar panels living at higher latitudes in the Northern Hemisphere feel that only too well. But look, there's a lot more wind during the winter, and that really does supplement the reduced solar generation. Now as it happens, in the UK there's a lot more wind capacity than solar capacity. And these charts reflect that, but they do show that solar and wind complement each other well all throughout the year. So does it make sense then for you to complement your own solar installation with a wind turbine? Let's dig into the detail. Let's say you have a 5 kilowatt peak array on your house. You can easily calculate your expected solar generation. For this location, it's just under 5,000 kilowatt hours for the year. If you live in a relatively windy location, you might be looking at then to supplement that by say an additional 2000 kilowatt hours over the year using a wind turbine. And this might lead you to some basic calculations like this. 2000 kilowatt hours annually is 5.48 kilowatt hours per day, which means an average power generation of 228 watts. Of course, it won't be windy all the time, but when it is windy, you'll hopefully capture a lot more power than that. So to be safe, you might start looking on Amazon for wind turbines with a power rating of say three times that at 600 watts. And you'll see there are quite a lot of wind turbines available. Here's one that is 600 watts. It's a traditional horizontal access turbine with five blades and it's a bargain at only 200 pounds. Alternatively, here's a vertical access turbine, also 600 watts. It's also slightly cheaper at 170 pounds and it might look a bit more aesthetic on your roof. Or here's another horizontal axis turbine, again for 200 pounds, but it has a slightly higher power rating, 800 watts, surely more efficient for what we need, yeah? Seriously though, don't be fooled by these cheap products. They promise high performance, but in practice they rarely ever achieve that and may fail after just a few weeks. And if you don't believe me, I've put a few links in the description for YouTube videos where people have bought these products only to be severely disappointed. If you want to get serious about having a wind turbine, then it's worth understanding the various technical aspects of the technology. And that will involve more detailed research and calculations to see if a wind turbine makes sense where you live. Now I promise I won't get too heavy, so please stay with me. How do you go about working out just how much energy a wind turbine will generate over a year then? Well, it starts by working out the power of a wind turbine for a given size and wind speed. And at this point, I'd like to thank Rosie Barnes, who has a channel called Engineering with Rosie. She kindly allowed me to refer to research she carried out on wind turbines, which was invaluable in the making of this video. The size of a wind turbine is generally denoted by what is called the windswept area. And with our horizontal access turbine example here, the windswept area is simply the area of a circle with radius r. And if you cast your mind back to your school days, you'll remember the formula A equals pi r squared. So now that we have the windswept area for our wind turbine, we can now work out the expected power generated for a given wind speed. And apologies in advance, as you can see, the formula for that is a little involved, 
But don't worry, we'll analyse and simplify things as we go. The A in the formula is the windswept area, and as we already know that, we can substitute in pi r squared. OK, I said we were going to simplify things and the formula's just got longer, but don't worry, it's easier from here on in, honest. P is the air density at the height of the wind turbine in kilograms per meters cubed. I checked this and for most locations on Earth it's roughly 1.2 for heights up to 250 meters, so we'll use that. Pi we know is approximately 3.14, R we already know is the radius and we'll come back to that shortly, V is the wind speed and we'll also come back to that shortly. Now C is the power coefficient, this is how efficient the turbine is at converting wind into power. There is a theoretical limit on that called the Betts limit and it's 59.3% but most wind turbines get around 40% or 0.4 expressed as a decimal so we'll use that. And finally N is the combined efficiency of the gearbox, generator and other components in the turbine which is typically around 90% or 0.9 when expressed as a decimal. If we now consolidate all of those fixed values in our formula into a single constant we get power equals 0.68 multiplied by the radius squared multiplied by the wind speed cubed. Now the significance of the squaring and cubing in this formula cannot be overstated. It shows the profound influence of both the radius and the wind speed on the final outcome. For example, if you double the radius from say 50 centimetres to 100 centimetres, you don't just double the power, you quadruple it. And if instead you were able to triple the radius from say 50 centimetres to 150 centimetres, you'd end up with nine times the power. But even more profound is the effect that wind speed has on power. If the wind speed is doubled say from 3 metres per second to 6 metres per second, the turbine will generate eight times as much power. And if the wind speed is instead tripled from 3 metres per second to 9 metres per second, the turbine will generate a whopping 27 times as much power. I think you can see why industrial wind turbines continue to get larger and larger and are placed in locations where there are the highest wind speeds, both high up from the ground and even offshore. In order to generate the most amount of electricity then, you'd want to get hold of a wind turbine that has the largest swept area as is feasible for where you live. And you'd want to install it as high up as you can because that's where the higher wind speeds are. To show you the effect of height in practice then, Let's have a look at some theoretical example installations. The first wind turbine has a swept area of 1 meter squared and is 10 meters off the ground. The second is the same size but this time 50 meters off the ground. And finally the third turbine is again the same size as the other two but this time 100 meters off the ground. We want to build a table for each of those turbine heights and then determine the average wind speed for those heights, calculate the average power from that wind speed and from that calculate the expected annual generation. But how do we determine the average wind speeds from those heights? Luckily there is a brilliant website called the Global Wind Atlas which can tell you the average wind speed for any location on the planet and for various heights at those locations. In our examples we'll set the location to a place called Abingdon near Oxford in the UK. And if we set the height to 10 meters we can read off the wind speed at that location which is 3.1 meters per second. We can then set the height to 50 meters, then 100 meters and repeat. And once all that's done, we can enter those wind speeds into our table. Now we're ready to calculate the average power using the formula that we looked at earlier. And we can calculate the annual generation by multiplying the power figures by 24 hours and 365 days. I think you can see immediately that in an urban area, a small wind turbine, even at 10 meters high, will not generate much at all. 175 kilowatt hours is essentially a rounding error when compared to nearly 5,000 kilowatt hours that your solar array will do. And in order to generate the target 2,000 kilowatt hours that we're looking for, you'd need to install that turbine on a mast 100 meters high, or with a larger turbine at least 50 meters high. I'm not sure what your neighbors would think about that. And at 10 meters it's even worse if you're in a built up area. And that's because to get efficient generation you need clean undisturbed air. You'll likely get that if you're at least 50 meters above all of the buildings around you. But anything below that and the wind will be slower. And worse than that it will be turbulent. And wind turbines are not good with turbulent air. Reducing your potential generation dramatically 
maybe even only a tenth of what the calculations would predict. Ideally, you want to be in a location where you've got a clear path of undisturbed air coming in from miles away, for example, on top of a hill or on flat farmland or even next to the sea. The last place you want to be is in the middle of a housing development. If you want to find out more about the effect of wind turbine size and wind speed, I thoroughly recommend you watch this video from Engineering with Rosie that goes into detail on all of this. I'll put a link to it in the description. You're still here, so I guess that means I haven't put you off yet getting a wind turbine. All right then, let's have a look at a few other considerations then, and I'll try and be as positive as I can, but it won't be easy. Before we do though, I'd love it if you could like this video and even subscribe to the channel as both of these actions help get greater reach for my videos. And as you're probably aware by now, I'm a huge fan of Octopus Energy, and for good reason, they're the best energy provider that I know of. If you live in the UK, one fantastic way to support this channel is by switching to Octopus Energy using my referral code here. Not only will you receive £50 for doing so, but I'll also receive the same, which directly helps me create more and more content for you. A big thank you to everyone who has already made the switch using my code. Your support means the world to me. OK, let's start with planning permission. Before you go out buying a wind turbine, it's a good idea to check whether you're allowed to erect one on your property. Planning permission requirements will vary around the world. For example, in the USA, you may be part of a homeowners association, so you should check the conditions of your contract very carefully. And in the UK, it is possible to get a wind turbine without planning permission, but there are strict requirements that you have to adhere to, and they do vary between England, Scotland, Wales and Ireland. And even if you don't require planning permission, you might want to check with your neighbours before proceeding. After all, they might view your impending construction as an eyesore. And if it generates any kind of noise, you might get a lot of complaints. Actually, the noise of the wind turbine might upset you as well. You see, it's not a constant noise which the human brain can filter out over time. It's generally a variable pitch noise depending on the wind speed. And in the dead of night when there are no other sounds, that noise might drive you and your neighbours insane. So it's worth checking out all the reviews you can with the model of wind turbine that you're considering to see if it's going to be a problem or not. And even if the noise of the turbine itself is not an issue, if you're planning to attach it to your roof, you might find that vibrations from the turbine end up generating noise inside your property anyway. Let's now look at the costs. We saw some wind turbine costs earlier, but these really are toy products and I recommend you steer well clear of them. And remember, it's not just the cost of the wind turbine itself. There are costs to mount the unit, including the foundation, the mast, and also installation costs. There are also costs for the wiring and the equipment to integrate the generated power into your home AC supply. And there might also be costs to connect your wind turbine into your national grid. You should check with your local network distribution operator to find out all about that. Typical all-in costs for a moderately sized wind turbine installation could be well into the tens of thousands of pounds. And with that kind of outlay, you might be looking at 15, maybe 20 years or more to reach payback. And that's assuming the predicted wind speed calculations for your installation hold true. While we're talking about costs, we should also cover the costs of maintenance. Wind turbines have a number of moving parts, including gears and brakes. And of course, anything with moving parts will generally require regular maintenance to ensure optimum performance and longevity. This includes inspections, lubrication and occasional repairs. Maintenance costs of a typical wind turbine are typically 1-2% to of the initial cost and this should be factored into any payback calculations. Finally, you might want to consider insurance costs as well, in case your wind turbine should fail, perhaps falling over and damaging property, going on fire or both. Thanks for getting this far. If you were thinking about adding a wind turbine to your property, hopefully this video has been useful in highlighting the many considerations involved, and so that if you do proceed, you won't be wasting your money. And if you already have a wind turbine, please let me know in the comments about your experiences so far. Is it working well for you, or do you regret your purchase? One thing I find interesting is the contrast between having a wind turbine and just getting solar panels installed. Solar panels are relatively cheap and prices continue to fall year on year. They generally don't require planning permission, they're not unsightly and they don't make any noise. Even better, they'll last 25 years requiring hardly any maintenance. 
And over those 25 years, a single solar panel could generate over 10,000 kilowatt hours of energy. Quite amazing, really. Until next time, then, thanks for watching.